Hello everyone, this presentation will be on bronchiolitis. The slides are made by the Indian Academy of Pediatricians 2015 UG teaching modules. On the basis of these slides, I will explain about the etiology, the clinical features, a few radiological signs as well as the management. Now, we all know that bronchiolitis is the most common serious uh, lower respiratory tract infection requiring hospital admission. It's the most important pediatric burden of illness worldwide and is generally self-limiting. But it is important to note that the symptoms are much, much more than the signs and the symptoms are more worrisome than it often is. Now, by definition, we know it's a clinical syndrome and the age group in which we do see uh, bronchiolitis is between 2 months to 2 years, although earlier is also seen. So, 2 months to 2 years is the age group. And initially it begins as symptoms of an upper respiratory tract viral infection starting as cough, subsequently cold, might be presence of fever, occasionally presence of coryza, generally progressing over 4 to 6 days. And over this course there will be cough as well as breathlessness and wheezing and other complaints as well from the respiratory tract. Now all of this will suggest a lower respiratory tract involvement whereas initially it began as an upper respiratory tract involvement. Now, the epidemiology of it, if we consider, its increased incidence is seen more in premature babies, premature children, and is most commonly seen in children who are less than one year of age. Now, although definition-wise, it is up to two years of age, maximum cases are seen in less than 12 months. And almost more than half of the affected children are between two to seven months of age, and the highest risk, per se, is in infants who are less than six months of age. Now, only two to three percent of these children require hospital admission and the season for bronchiolitis, if we can call it so, is late autumn and early spring. So generally we can say that after September to November and maybe even early December and early spring in the months of Feb and early March. All of these we can say are the seasons for bronchiolitis. Although it can happen at any given point of time in the year and most commonly it also does aggravate in the rainy season as well. So I can even add monsoon as well. Now, uh, before coming to the predisposing factors, I would like to mention upon the etiology. The most common etiological uh, organism which causes bronchiolitis is respiratory syncytial virus, also known as RSV. RSV accounts for almost 90% of all bronchiolitis and the remaining 10% is accounted by influenza virus, para-influenza virus, adenovirus, uh, light, milder forms of coronavirus and rhinovirus as well. And as far as bacterial causes are concerned, mycoplasma pneumonia is isolated occasionally but is not recognized as the etiological agent. As far as etiology is concerned, remember RSV, RSV and RSV is the etiological source for bronchiolitis. Now, uh, coming to the predisposing factors for uh, hospitalization, generally it's infants who are in daycare with an exposure to a crowded environment at home. Uh, with certain environmental factors and exposure to passive smoking, all are additional risk factors for predisposing to bronchiolitis. Now, if you come to the pathophysiology of it, uh, it comprises of three aspects. One being airway obstruction, one being atelectasis or over distension and hypoxemia. Now, uh, the airway obstruction is mainly because of sloughed epithelial cells and accumulation of neutrophils and lymphocytes within this slough as a result of which the airway gets obstructed. As a result of that, because there is a partial plugging of some airways, there is an over distension or an over inflation at the terminal part uh, from that portion. And as a result of this, hypoxemia happens because of a ventilation perfusion imbalance. It's important to note that once there is an airway plugging, the only treatment is respiratory support and oxygenation. So the aim is to prevent this airway plugging from happening. If you notice, as far as the pathophysiology is concerned, the airway obstruction results in the plugging of airways and as a result of the plugging of airways, there is a ventilation perfusion misbalance and as a result of it, there is hypoxemia. So each of these is interrelated with each other. So the crux of the pathophysiology is airway obstruction, atelectasis and over distension, hypercrowding as well as hypoxemia. Now, the clinical features of bronchiolitis is quite variable, but often the first symptom with which the child is brought is a nasal obstruction, which may or may not be associated with a complaint of runny nose. Apart from that, there might be a complaint of cough, which initially might be of an irritating nature and subsequently goes on to be mildly productive. The child might be taking feeds well in the initial stages, but subsequently there will be poor feeding practices. And 
apnea is seen in 20% of infants who are less than 12 months of age with rsv and occasionally fever may be present fever may be present it may not be present but the presence of fever is not definitive presence of fever does warrant additional test and additional medication for treatment bronchiolitis may present with fever it may present without as well now coming to respiratory distress we can classify it into mild moderate and severe based on the symptoms and the signs what we do observe the clinical features of distress include nasal flaring tachypnea expanded chest and an audible wheeze on auscultation poor air entry presence of bronchi or conducted sounds bronchi are definitive but conducted sounds can also be the only finding which is seen in bronchiolitis and other features rarely which can be rhinitis otitis media and conjunctivitis and a mild to moderate degree of hypoxia will be seen on pulse oximetry that is on checking the saturation and on arterial blood gas but bronchiolitis is more of a clinical diagnosis accompanied by radiological findings nasal flaring tachypnea expanded chest and audible wheeze all of which are important now we classify bronchiolitis clinically into mild moderate and severe based on three components the ability to feed the respiratory effort of the child and the saturation which is observed at admission now mild bronchiolitis the child will be able to take feeds adequately with a decent respiratory effort without much distress and saturation maintaining moderate bronchiolitis the ability to feed might be slightly impaired and there might be a history of refusal of feeds but child will be able to take orally with a slight uh, distress upon feeds feeds aggravating the respiratory distress and saturation in the borderline when i say borderline the cut off is 92% for maintaining saturation so less than 92% is defined as hypoxia now severe bronchiolitis is where there is a refusal of feeds respiratory distress is present and saturation is not maintaining and requires additional support now to investigate a case of bronchiolitis a complete blood count is of course required the purpose of complete blood count is uh, the total count and differential count will more or less give a picture as to whether it is a viral or, or a bacterial etiology now bronchiolitis there might be an increase in the total count or it might be normal but a classical bronchiolitis will have a lymphocytic predominant differential count so lymphocytes will be more than neutrophils and as a result of this based on these two parameters alone we can ensure that we don't unnecessarily give antibiotics to the child apart from that chest x ray is a diagnostic investigation which is a must for bronchiolitis and uh, based on the chest x ray we can observe for the typical fi- features of hyperinflation so hyperinflation is an important characteristic feature of bronchiolitis apart from that uh, some centers do nasopharyngeal aspirate for rsv culture and viral culture it's not widely available in many centers and it's not a must and it doesn't really affect the uh, prognosis in long term but a nasopharyngeal aspirate is uh, good for those uh, working in the field of rsv and uh, working from a research perspective electrolytes are to be measured in a child who is dull looking may be presenting in altered sensorium or with a prolonged refusal of feeds and especially if uh, the child requires iv fluids now a blood culture is sent only if the child is having a temperature representation and only if the temperature is present a culture is sent just to ensure that we don't rule out uh, we don't miss out uh, any uh, super added bacterial infection and if an antibiotic is being added empirically it is always better to send a culture and uh, to ensure that a sensitivity pattern is available abgs are required for a sick child to ensure that the ph balance is maintained as well as the other electrolytes are also maintained in a normal rhythm and it also tells about the hypoxia status of the child but as a thumb rule it is important to note that mild forms of bronchiolitis do not require any lab investigation of any sort the treatment is purely supportive and the diagnosis is purely clinical for bronchiolitis now on chest x ray if you observe this x ray what is seen here it shows hyperinflation with mild patchy infiltrates especially here in the pericardiac region so i'll just mark that you can see and once i marked it i think it draws your attention towards it and generally these infiltrates are post migratory and post obstructive because of atelectasis and as per the bronchial cuffing as well i'll just show another x ray also this is another typical x ray of bronchiolitis uh, as you can see in this image it just at first glance does appear to be clear there is no obvious infiltrates which are present 
Apart from that, if you do count the rips, there is a clear cut crowding of rips and there is a hyperinflation. So if we start to count on the left side, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 ribs if you count anteriorly and if you do count the posterior ribs it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Any which ways if you do count it is a crowding of ribs and it by definition does appear to be uh, bronchiolitis. Also if you do observe the intercostal uh, spaces, the intercostal spaces also do appear to be hyperinflated. The uh, air density also does appear to be affected so this is a clear cut image of bronchiolitis. The x-ray of the child whom you do see was 2 years old and he was brought with severe respiratory distress. But the x-ray findings at face value does not correlate mainly because bronchiolitis is a disease where symptoms much match the signs in many regards. Now, uh, like I mentioned time and again, uh, it is a clinical diagnosis and uh, any infant with a short prodromal history of an upper respiratory tract infection should be suspected to be bronchiolitis if the disease progresses. Now clinically, it will be uh, presenting with respiratory distress with or without chest retractions. On auscultation, you might find uh, crepitations or a wheeze and an audible wheeze might be present without even auscultating the child. Now uh, differential diagnosis to keep in mind uh, if you do get a case of bronchiolitis of course. First of course considering the age group would be a foreign body aspiration. So a foreign body is definitely most likely to be ruled out on an x-ray. So an x-ray will rule out a foreign body and foreign body will generally present with a unilateral base because there is a prediction for the foreign body to go into the right bronchus. Secondly, an aspiration pneumonia in this age group because of feeds. Uh, an aspiration pneumonia on the x-ray will tend to have an involvement towards the upper lobe. So because of an upper lobe involvement and aspiration pneumonia does tend to be missed out, I will show an x-ray and uh, that will tell a clear cut difference between the two. This x-ray shows a, a 45 day old baby with uh, aspiration pneumonia. As you can see there is a clear cut involvement of the right upper lobe and there is no generalized involvement of any of the lungs. So unlike the previous x-ray what you saw there is a definitive involvement with a prediction to the upper lobe. So based on the x-ray an aspiration pneumonia can be more or less ruled out. Apart from this uh, we can also consider a gastroesophageal reflux as well as other congenital laminaries such as a vascular ring or a congenital heart disease which required more detailed evaluation. And we can consider a congenital anomaly or a congenital heart disease if the saturation continues to progressively worsen and does not respond despite supportive treatment. Now, the management of bronchiolitis is more supportive and supportive care is the mainstay for therapy. Mild to moderately ill infants require purely supplementary oxygen. Humidified oxygen is the treatment of choice for bronchiolitis and is probably the only treatment which should be given in a hospital setting. For children who are not able to take feeds orally and who are not able to feed well, IV fluids are indicated to ensure that the nutritional status is maintained and it also helps in ensuring that the tachypnea and the partial nasal obstruction is not worsened. Now, uh, coming to the role of other medications such as bronchodilators, it is controversial and some institutes do prefer to give acetylene, uh, that is albutamol, in a phased manner initially every second hourly and slowly taper to fourth followed by eighth and uh, slowly tapered off. Now, another important uh, methodology of treatment is giving 3% uh, normal saline nebulization. Now 3% normal saline acts as uh, somewhat of a humidifier and to ensure that secretions are able to come out. So initially if you do start giving this every second hourly and slowly taper to fourth and eighth hourly, it ensures that whatever secretions are there are able to come out and 3% uh, normal saline plus regular suctioning does ensure that secretions do not uh, collect and if these secretions don't collect it ensures that the child is able to supportively uh, take breaths on his own comfortably. Like I mentioned humidified oxygen is ideal to be given and uh, supplemental oxygen is always indicated if the SpO2 is less than 92 and uh, it's more or less a clinical uh, diagnosis and the target SpO2 is to be maintained above 95 percent. Now the methodology of giving this O2 can be because of a low flow device or a high flow device. Low flow devices such as nasal prongs, face mask or hood uh, are advisable if it is in the initial stages. If a low flow device is not able to deliver sufficient oxygen, switch to a high flow device. Hood can be a high flow device as well. Otherwise switch to an NRM mask or consider using CPAP. 
Now, if there is distress, uh, despite uh, giving supplementary oxygen, despite using a high flow device, and uh, distress is worsening and not settling, at that time consider ventilatory support or consider using CPAP at that time. IV fluids are indicated if the child is not able to take feeds adequately and once started on feeds, it is always better to uh, reduce the feeds, uh, reduce the fluids, I'm sorry, to half volume or to quarter volume and gradually taper. Once started on IV fluids, it's always better to monitor the serum electrolytes to rule out any electrolyte imbalance. And uh, definitive indications for giving IV fluids include nasal flaring, tachypnea, if uh, rate is above what is expected for that age any apneic episodes, retractions during feeds particularly. Now, bronchiolitis can definitely be managed in a ward setting, but ICU management also must be considered if the child is progressing towards more severe respiratory distress, if there is an additional risk factor, or if there are apneic episodes associated with desaturation, or persistent desaturation despite giving supplemental oxygen, or oxygen not being re sufficient requiring ventilatory support or CPAP and if there is AB on uh, arterial blood gas if there is evidence of respiratory failure namely PO2 being less than 80 PCO2 being more than 50 and market acidosis of pH less than 7 all of these are criteria to shift into a PICO and manage under an ICO setup now CPAP is nothing but a continuous positive airway pressure it's a step above our high flow devices and a step below additional ventilatory effort. So the benefit of CPAP is it ensures that the airway is maintained in all uh, phases of respiration and it prevents air trapping and obstructive disease. Uh, if you do come to the mechanism of CPAP, we all know that if we consider an alveoli and this is a normal uh, alveoli at a resting phase, we all know that an alveoli does expand and it also contracts. So there is an expansion as well as a contraction of the alveoli. We all know that uh, it takes some amount of effort for the alveoli to open and close continuously. But by giving CPAP, it ensures that these alveoli always remain open. So it prevents this collapse. So by ensuring that the alveoli always remain open, it prevents air trapping and the obstructive disease. And hence, CPAP is considered to be a next level of management above ventilatory uh, before ventilatory support and above conventional oxygen. Uh, once we have treated the child with bronchiolitis, it is, of course, uh, always ideal to discharge the child as soon as possible to allay the parental fears and also in good interest of the child that the uh, child is recovered. So, so if the child has very minimal respiratory distress and is able to maintain saturation at room air, except for if... Uh, the child is having a chronic lung disease or is having a congenital heart disease or other risk factors and has not received supplemental oxygen for more than 10 hours although in practical setting a 24 hour observation is more advisable and if there is minimal or no chest retraction and the child is able to take, take feeds adequately and the child is active then it is a good criteria for discharge of the child uh, complications wise respiratory complications are most frequent Infectious complications due to superadded bacterial infections are likely. If a superadded bacterial infection is uh, there, at that time antibiotic coverage might be required, otherwise not routinely indicated. Cardiovascular uh, complications and electrolyte imbalance is a rare complication, but needs to be managed if found to be present. Uh, studies have shown that these complications are higher, like I mentioned, in uh, newborns and infants who have congenital heart disease, other anomalies premature infants and particularly in the age group of 33-35 weeks and these do tend to have a longer hospital stay and a higher cost as far as the healthcare burden is concerned. Severe complications of course can be respiratory failure, apnea, uh, superadded bacterial infections if more severe due to multi uh, multiple drug resistant strains such as MRSA or VRSA. Both of these are more dreaded complications as far as uh, infections are concerned. Uh, if you consider thoracic complications, pneumothorax is rare but likely and congenital abnormalities do tend to aggravate uh, this risk. Prognosis-wise, uh, bronchiolitis does tend to be self-limiting and only 2-3% to of children require hospitalization and if they are hospitalized also, it is only supportive therapy and very minimum active intervention. However, it is important to identify these high-risk groups and these high-risk groups are at risk of uh, more rapid deterioration 
and even in these high risk groups death purely because of bronchiolitis is unlikely whatever mortality is seen in bronchiolitis is because of super added uh, bacterial infection because of more deadly strains of mrsa or vrsa uh, before concluding the presentation it, i would like to add an extra point that uh, upon discharge routine immunization of uh, these children is a must and these uh, parents are also to be counseled for optional vaccines now the optional vaccines such as pcv and influenza vaccine do have a role in uh, reducing the amount of pneumonia uh, and incidence of pneumonia rather and uh, because children in the bronchiolitis age group are more prone for recurrent respiratory tract infections uh, those who are affordable if counseled for these vaccinations it does tend to reduce the burden of the disease in long term on that note i thank you all for listening uh, the presentation is intended at uh, medical students uh, from a knowledge point of view and uh, to an extent to parents for bringing awareness if uh, you feel your child has any of these signs or symptoms i strongly recommend you to uh, visit a uh, medical practitioner uh, this presentation cannot uh, replace the advice of a medical practitioner based on physically examining your child and the purpose of this uh, presentation is more from a theoretical per uh, perspective and for an awareness i once again thank iap for the making the slides available and uh, for the continuous good work what is done in uh, pediatric health thank you